You are listening to the Let Me Overthink About It podcast, where I dive into a series of topics that occupy my anxious mind. I'm Sam Ador, overthinker extraordinaire. This week, I'm overthinking about imposter sisterhood with Alex Robinson and Colleen O'Day. Colleen and Alex are co-hosts of the Imposter Sisters podcast, which is one of my favorites. Here's our chat. I am here with the Imposter Sisters. I've got Alex Robinson and Colleen O'Day. Hey, guys. Hey, guys. Hey. I'm so excited for us to be having this chat where we did a bit of podcast tradesies. We did. It's a swap. (laughs) We loved having you on Imposter Sisters. We had so much fun that night just chit-chatting away. You're just a fresh, freshness, Sam. Oh, man, I love it. I'm not feeling fresh. You know, it's funny, uh, because I do a mental health podcast, you guys probably can relate to this doing a podcast called Imposter Sisters, where you're just like about to go live. And you're like, what am I even doing? Like, like, what is going on here? Does this? Is this how you feel like an imposter? We get it a lot. Uh, yeah. We're sort of, and it's like, every who time. Am I? yeah, who it's am I so to be crazy. doing this? Who am I to have this knowledge? Who am I to even be conducting? And uh, anyway, Yes. Yeah. And I just feel like, too, it's kind of in a twisted way, though, it's kind of good to show up to some interviews sometimes feeling that way because it's coming from, you know, when the feeling of like you 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 have a hair appointment booked and it's your best hair day ever. Like, I feel like if you are always doing your mental health podcast from like a good day, then it's probably not going to be your most truthful or honest conversation each time. Does that make sense? Yes, I think we are lucky because we always record on Sunday nights and I never feel good on Sunday nights. <laughs> I always feel like shit. Oh, can we swear on this? Sorry. Yes, you can. So did you, what? So let's talk about it. Okay, we got to go back because I have to assume that potentially there's some people listening who aren't aware of your podcast. So let's go into the why of the Imposter Sisters podcast. I think for both of us, we've been looking for a pattern we're friends and we were looking for a passion project. We were looking for a project to do together. Um, And we meet every week just as friends for coffee. And, you know, this time and time, this idea of not feeling like we're good enough or feeling like we're faking it or feeling like we're comparing ourselves to others and all this sort of stuff kept coming up over and over. And, And we learned about imposter syndrome. And we were like, we both have imposter syndrome. And then one day we were chit-chatting about it and was like, you know what, we should do a podcast. Why don't we do a podcast on imposter syndrome? And within, we just like put a little word out there about it. And then the next week, Alex had the URL. She booked it all off. She'd had the name. She found like the name, everything. She was like, okay, we're ready to go. And it was funny starting a podcast because neither of us had any idea what we were doing. Yeah. But starting as this idea of being complete imposters gave us a lot of leeway to really not know what we were doing. It was great. Being in a in a creative industry, it just comes up a lot. Um, feeling like you're not really sure what you're doing or not sure what the measures of success are, which can lead to a lot of questioning like, am I successful? What am I doing? Um, so I think that also kind of played into it too, because we felt yeah. like, in other conversations that we had had, and even with our own clients, because we both work in social media management, um, a lot of people were having a hard time showing up. So we just thought it was a really topical um, thing to talk about. Mm -hmm. Well, I know for sure, as soon as you guys posted about it, I was like, I can so relate to that. Um, And I know so many people who can. And when you say that about social media management and the creative industry, like I've been thinking a lot about this, how um, this is not new information, but how creative people are oftentimes saddled with mental health issues, or like you're saying, those feelings of inadequacy or or whatnot. Would you guys agree? You're both nodding. Would you guys agree or disagree with that statement and how? 100% agree with it. I deal with it in my own life. Um, And, and my daughter who's creative, she deals with it. And then most of our clients who are creative people, they're dealing with it too. I mean, it's, it's tough because you're, you're putting your creativeness out there. And sometimes whether even if like, if you're a painter, if you're a musician, you're putting your creativeness, something you made 
out there into the world to be judged. And and it, it's an uneasy feeling. I think, too, there's a lot of the same emotions that drive the creativity also drive the um, brain activity that sometimes isn't always the most positive brain activity. So I feel like the two kind of go hand in hand in a way, um, which is sort of unfortunate, but fortunate, I guess. Uh, I just think that there's sort of like whatever pushes the creativity also pushes all the other, um, I don't know, eccentric thinking. (laughs) So I feel like they're kind of intertwined, whether we like it or not. I love it. And one of the things that um, I often think about in relation to all of this talk is the connection with ego as well, because I feel like you know, there's that fear of putting stuff out there when you're creative, because like Colleen, you were saying, it's like you're putting your your own, like, your own creative things, for lack of a better word, out in the universe. And so that's scary. And I think too, sometimes it's the ego, because it's like, well, what are people going to say? Or are they going to like, I can't face that judgment that you assume is going to come from that. Ego and fear play a big part of it, for sure. Alex? Yeah, I think fear of judgment is what keeps a lot of people from showing up in a way that they'd like to. I mean, us included. uh, I feel like, you know, how you push yourself through that or how you get past it is a different thing. But I think ego is highly tied into anything that's, you know, that, that puts you out there for people to have an opinion on you. Yeah. And it goes to, and I, I love how you said you you had a lot of leeway with putting the imposter syndrome or imposter sisters podcast out there because you're like, well, we're calling ourselves imposters. So if we don't know what we're doing, then it kind of fits with what like the theme of the podcast. But do you think it, that it, that helped you press send or press post on that first it, podcast? My cat is knocking things down here. It worked. It It really did work for us until we got called out on it. Um, so we were saying a lot of times, don't worry about it. We don't know what we're doing. And we said it so many times. Um, we don't know what we're doing. Give us grace. We don't know what we're doing that we got called out. Um, we were doing a presentation and somebody told us that we said we didn't know what we were doing seven times. And she turned around and she said, you know, you guys do know what you're doing. You're doing it. And stop telling people you don't know what you're doing. And it was like, oh, we were maybe using it as a little bit of a crutch, I guess. Do you think that was? I don't know. I'm still using it. Like, you know, there's still stuff. There's still stuff to learn all the time. Um, And I don't think that we're like pros by any means. If you listen to our audio quality, you would probably agree. Um, but yes, we're we're doing it. We're on we just finished recording our second season. So, you know. It's happening. Yeah, we did. Um, and I think we're co- we're both comfortable doing it not perfectly, like being yeah. just being ourselves, being authentic. And if we make mistakes or if we screw up or if we, I think we're we're getting more okay with doing that on the podcast because it's called imposter. In other areas of our lives, maybe we're not so comfortable with that. But on the podcast, it's the one area that we're like, whatever, we can do whatever we want because we're imposters. So it, if right, it feels safer. Yeah, I, I think too you. the the vulnerability of of that kind of statement on the podcast makes other people feel um, comfortable too. And coming on to the podcast when you know it's not like this highly highly produced thing where you need to be perfect with your words and everything is scripted and you know it's. I think it it lowers the barrier for entry for people who want to be a guest on it uh, because it is, yeah. you know, um, like amateur to, you know, slightly higher amateur at this point, I guess. Yeah, we I, have very I, low, expect, very, very low expectations of ourselves. It's it's good. I love it. And I at first I thought you said immature. <laughs> <laughs> that too. <laughs> That, that too. It's true. Yeah. I feel that about my own podcast sometimes. I'm like, yeah, I feel a little immature. Um, definitely. And I think too, it's so funny because I got some funding this season from the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia. And I'm, so, of course, so grateful for that funding. But immediately I was like, oh shit, like somebody now is like going to care. <laughs> like, there's somebody out there who might be like, oh, that is not really the quality we anticipated for this funding. It's so crazy. And there comes that imposter syndrome, right? Yeah. I'm I'm really glad there's not an imposter foundation of Canada giving us a grant, (laughs) let me tell you, because... Not yet. Not yet. (laughs) Unless we start it. Yeah, true. This could be the starting point of you. Yes, your own nonprofit about imposters. I kind (laughs) of, I kind of like it. 
You, you heard it here first. <laughs> That's right. So before this, and I know you guys chatted about how you're both in creative fields and and in social media management before this, what would you say sort of led to your, you know, your wanting to have a a podcast or wanting to have a voice for imposters? Uh, I think we just both felt very strongly, or at least we knew that the topics that were coming up in our daily chats were, which kind of became, we started off as accountability partners. And I say that in quotes because we never actually held each other accountable. What is happening with those balloons? Um, um, I don't know how that I just that, but. Love. That was fantastic. <laughs> okay. If you're so. watching on YouTube, you just got the best little treat, which was just some random balloons flying around Alex's head. <laughs> was that anyway? I guess did... when I guess with air quotes uh, comes air balloons. But the reason I'm using air quotes is because we never actually held each other accountable. We just became really close friends and were more like sounding boards. And a lot of the th- the topics that were coming up for each other that we were kind of coaching out each other through were these self doubt or these bouts of self doubt with things. Um, and we just knew that that camaraderie and that those conversations became so vital, like complete lines for us. And we figured that that was probably something that other people were needing too. So that's sort of where it started. And then this want to have a passion project and work on something together. Um, and then it just kind of was so well received that it got some momentum. And then we've, it's led to live recordings and speaking engagements and, and things that we had never envisioned for it. It was just something fun that we wanted to do together. And it kind of like took off on its own. And do you think, was there ever a fear? I often think about this when I share about my depression and my anxiety. Was there ever any fear of like, is this going to impact or affect my clients that I have? have in my other world or you know just like if I'm going around calling myself an imposter like is someone going to take that to heart and and not you know respect or what however you want to call that was there any fear of that for sure I think maybe earlier in my in my career I cared more about putting my authentic self out there and how I would be judged and like I remember when I started the blog years ago and writing things on the blog and I thought oh I've got clients that are reading this stuff and maybe I shouldn't be putting it all out there and then I realized that I was getting clients because of the type of information I shared And I realized that by being myself as vulnerable and as authentic and whatever, as by being myself, that's what people were, were, I don't want to say drawn to, but that's what people liked about me and um, and it, it paid off. And I think that in this day and age of social media, I think being yourself online is really incredibly important, you know, so we're putting it out there. What a great answer to that question. I would second that. I think, you know, I've always tried to be pretty vulnerable with uh, on my social media um, and kind of show that it's not all fun and games and that I don't always know everything. Um, So it wasn't a huge risk for me in terms of feeling like people might think something differently of me. Um, But certainly it's always scary when you're admitting that you don't know everything. But one of the things I decided early on when I started my business is that I was not going to pretend that I knew things because that makes me uncomfortable. And that makes me feel like I have to like that I'm lying and then I can get caught in a web of this. Um, So I just decided early on to, you know, own whatever I didn't know and, and do my best to learn it. So I think that kind of just it felt natural to continue that narrative. I love that. Own what you don't know. Because a lot of, yeah, a lot of times, and I've done this in my career, and it makes me want to throw up when I think back on it, when you just don't ask the question, because you're scared that someone's going to judge you for not knowing the answer or not being able to just do it all or whatever. And I'm just like, ugh, I hate that I used to be that person wasting time. Well, I think people actually respect you more when you admit that you don't know everything. And but it doesn't mean that you're not going to find an answer. It just means that you don't immediately know everything. And I did the same thing early in my career. So that's why I decided when I was going this route, you know, I was a first time business owner, so I wasn't going to know everything. And that's okay. Yeah, totally. And I like how you said earlier, too, that you guys were accountability partners, or I can't remember the exact terminology you used, Alex, but because as entrepreneurs, as women, I think in general in business or whatever, it's so important to have those folks who you can lean on, especially as a solo entrepreneur to be like, oh God, like I just need somebody who gets it, who can just kind of listen without judgment. We we mm-hmm. failed a little bit at accountability of partners because, you know, we started during the pandemic, we met during the pandemic online and 
And I, and I was looking, but Alex and I were both looking for somebody to kind of push us, push us, you know, to the next week and the next week. And we, we met every week on Tuesdays. Um, but then sometimes Tuesdays we would get online. It's like, Oh, I'm having a bad day. And the other person, yeah, I am too. And we would just like hang out. But I think we realized that by listening to one another, we didn't always have to be pushing each other to the next level, to be pushing each other to do the next project or, you know, come on, girl, you can do it. It was more about listening. And, and sometimes it was just breathing with one another. Like sometimes it was just being in a room and being there for one another. That was the accountability of it. And we quickly realized this idea of accountability partners was, was friendship, you know, and you're always looking for that person that, will like you said listen to you and be there for you yeah it was it was good it was it turned into a great friendship yeah I think it was more like picking up the pieces and and you know bolstering each other we have, we both went through some pretty heavy emotional things and my dad was sick and and died through at that time and having that friendship and having that um somebody to like you know just hear me when I needed it was huge and Colleen also had some similar things that we just kind of helped each other get through um, but we also still had to run our businesses in the meantime, too. So it was just really helpful to have that backbone um, mm-hmm. or that sort of like crash mat when you're, you know, you're about to like hit rock bottom to kind of boost you back up um, so that you can keep going. So important. And sorry to hear about your dad. That's so hard. And I, I hear what you're saying. And that listening piece is so it's almost underrated in some ways. Uh, you know, when you think, oh, I need to provide that solution, or I need to help that person, whatever, like helping doesn't have to be as complicated as we sometimes think it is. Yeah. And I think the ego part of it comes into it as well, that we're we're out there, we're running these businesses as entrepreneurs, and you don't want anyone to think that you're not pulling it off, that you're not doing yeah. well. You know, we're all out there just, we've got stuff going on in our lives. So to have somebody who was in the same business as you being able, that you could trust, that wasn't judging you, like, I think we all need that. I think whether you're doing it on your own or you're in a big corporation, I think you need somebody who's got your back, you know? Not judging you, also not trying to come up behind you and steal your clients. (laughs) Oh, yeah, yeah, it's a huge risk. I mean, I remember when I reached out to Alex and I thought, wow, she's in the same business as me. And here I am reaching out to somebody at the pandemic pandemic to say, hey, how are you doing it? And and I thought this was a little bit different. This is a little bit, um, a little risky, I guess, but yeah, I don't know. I think, I think I truly believe in collaboration over competition. Totally. Um, I've always believed it and I believe in supporting women and it was just the next step. And I mean, now Alex and I, Alex, we have a lot of women in our circle who are doing the exact same type of work that we're doing and we bounce ideas off each other. There's enough clients out there for everybody. Like, Yeah, I would say like our businesses have grown because of each other, just because of the guidance and support that we've given each other and the learning that we have, like we, we have very different approaches and skill sets. So being able to um, learn from each other has been huge too. It's the abundance versus scarcity mindset. And I think that as women, we often um, we often assume that there's not enough out there for all of us. And that is just absolutely not the case. And we actually have a group of women that we meet with here locally. Michelle McCann is one of them who is just on your on your podcast. And uh, we do similar work. A lot of us do similar work where whether it's social media or marketing or web design or whatever that is, we're all very similar. But again, like you're saying, we push each other to do better and we push each other to get that proposal out there. And I think just having that support is such a huge, huge, huge thing. Agree. Yeah. And you're, I, I love I love what you and Michelle are doing. I actually look at the group of Toro girls and I I think Alex and I, we've we've kind of got a very similar group here. It's kind of it's nice. It's it's nice that we're all helping each other out. I just I think it's an uncertain market, so it's nice to have people to bounce things off of, um, and it's always changing too. So it's it's good to have a sounding board to figure out, you know, oh, is this going to work, or is this concept going to work, or how would you approach this concept, kind of thing. So yeah, I love it. And I had I was so sad because I had a conflict. You guys did your second live um, recording recently with Dr. Ashley Margison, and she's literally one of my favorite people. And I had a conflict. I had choir practice on I have it every Sunday night. So I, I wasn't able to go. But 
I was so disappointed. I just, and hearing the feedback and everything, I had huge FOMO for not being there, but what is the benefit? Cause you guys do your recordings on Sundays, just one-on-one usually. What was the benefit for you guys of incorporating that live piece? I don't even remember why we decided to do that, Alex. What was, I think we just wanted to build a more um, like in-person community around it. We knew after the first season that there was buzz about it and people like, after our first season, people re- were reaching out to us to be guests. So we knew that there was some momentum there and some room to actually grow a physical community around it. So I think that was sort of the first thought about maybe we should have a networking event. Maybe we should bring in a live guest and, you know, just get more people involved in the community. Um, and then it's just a fun thing to do to kind of expand the brand a little bit and make it a little bit more um interactive because we get some really great question and answer periods in there and then also give some business to our our location sponsor who lets us use their cafe at no cost like which is mind-blowing so it's nice to be able to give them some catering dollars and you know just give back to that community but I think it was just generally speaking to bring everyone together and to see what like where we could go with it It's so great. And there is a different buzz for sure when you're in that environment. And actually, Colleen, the first I've done just the one live, actually two now. But anyway, the one live recording was the first one I did was Swell. And you were at that one. It was at that conference that Alex and I first started having the idea of doing a podcast together. I had interviewed the guest, the keynote speaker at that event. Um, and then we were kind of walking out of there going, Hmm, we should do this. That was fun. That was really enjoyable. So, but yes, it, the, the live stuff is really fun. I mean, the, the audio is challenging and all of that stuff to put it up later, but it's really yeah. fun to get into a room, um, with women and just, I don't know, just expand the brand, like Alex said, but just to hang out with like-minded women, it's really enjoyable. Totally. And it was Crawford that you interviewed at that event. And I've, I've had Crawford on this season um of my podcast as well and just an awesome human yeah they're they're an amazing person absolutely yeah for sure just that energy I think you know the fact that you guys were kind of starting to noodle around that idea again speaks to that energy that comes from a an in-person event with lots of women buzzing around I think that just inevitably happens I I like the idea that women that come to our event that it's a safe space to talk to other women. And it it would be very interesting to learn what they're deciding to collaborate on from there. I think it just gives you're right, that energy and just a space for more conversation and for projects and for collaboration. I love it. Well, and I think too, it's, it's not very often that there's an event where you're like openly talking about issues with confidence. Usually at networking events, you're trying to like bolster and and, like puff yourself up and build that confidence. But to be able to go into a room where you know that everybody is struggling with confidence, it kind of just makes it a little easier to walk in by yourself. And we've had a lot of people who have come solo um, because, you know, everybody in there is sort of struggling. So it's that I think that just makes it a, a little bit easier of an event to attend. Yeah, well, exactly that. And I think, yeah, I mean, that word networking, uh, of course, I had Mena Riley on here, too, who's networking expert in in Halifax and and Nova Scotia. And like, I just, that word just has such a negative association to it. And to the point where I mean, I have I have my women's social network here in Truro as well. I've just sort of revamped it, re brought uh, brought it back again. And uh, I try, even though it's called the Women's Social Network, I try to stay away from the word networking, not to scare people off, because it is a word that people just don't like. True. And Mena herself, even with leading ladies, like she knows that one of the things that works, she started this wing woman program. And the idea yes. is that you can show up alone and she introduces the wing women online ahead of time. Here are the three or four or five or six yep. women who are going to be there. And if you don't know anybody Go stand by them. Talk to them. They'll introduce you to people because it's it's so daunting. It is being at a networking event. It's it's terribly daunting. So I think the idea of taking this networking word out of a networking event and it's more of a collaboration friendship type project that you're that you're at, you know? Yeah. Yeah, like we call it the imposter roster, because, you know, it's the list of imposters, you know, you're on the list. I love it. And you mentioned the word confidence, Alex, and I think like all of it comes back to that big word of confidence and sort of how you 
how you feel. And that, by the way, can shift in a moment, how confident yeah. you feel. I think the thing that's interesting about imposter syndrome, and maybe not everybody knows, is that it's not a constant state. And just because you overcome it once doesn't mean it's not going to come back. There's a lot of ebbs and flows. And there's some natural triggers um, in your lifetime that are going to bring it on more than others. So it's just uh, understanding those waves and being able to ride them, which is really important. Um, because we are, we're going to dip in in our areas of confidence, depending on what's going on. And, and when we're, our confidence is low, it's, it's usually when the imposter syndrome shows up the most. And that's when you lean on your support system. You really do. We have learned so much from the women that have been on our, on our podcast. And from that, we've put together a presentation on confidence and learning how to speak up and learning how to find your voice and that sort of thing. And I remember when we first presented it, we kind of both of us were looking at each other going, is this even going to resonate with people? Are people going to be interested in learning about how to be more confident or some tools to, to trick yourself into being confident? And I got to say, we, we did this presentation and it was so well received. It, I think it, it floored us, didn't it, Alex? We were quite taken back by how how well received, but I think it also shows that a lot of women are out there just really faking it and trying to put their best foot forward when a lot of times we don't feel quite like we're trying to to show that we feel, you know? Oh, yeah, I yeah. think for sure when we were putting it together, we're like, who are we to be talking about confidence when we're still struggling, you know, on a daily basis? And then I said to Colleen, like, is this just like common sense? Are people going to think this is ridiculous? But we had people crying. We had people coming up to us afterwards just telling us how much it resonated. We had a woman who bought herself a Tiffany bracelet because she had been like living the, this confidence rules and was so proud to hear it reinforced in that way. So, you know, I guess it just is like never assume that people where people are in their journey, um, which I think is, you know, a lot of times what even brings on imposter syndrome is this comparison because we assume everybody is like living at their highlight reel when most of the time Hopefully. they're really they're really not. And that common sense thing too, right? It's like, yeah, and you might think, oh, the, and I've done it because I've done the mental health presentations and stuff where you're just talking about the self, like self care or whatever it is, and you're just like, I'm just gonna tell people up here now to go for a walk. Like I'm, just, you know what I mean? Like people know that they need to go for a walk to help their mental health, but it's like sometimes people just aren't saying it out loud, or they need to hear it again, or they, you know what I mean? It's those simple things that. Um, that you just need that reinforcement and being in a room of people who are nodding their heads is, is what you also need to be able to see that you're not the only one feeling that way. It's the feeling of, it's that whole idea of I'm not alone. Yeah. That I think is so huge for people when, when women are sitting in the room and they're like, oh yeah, I feel that too. Oh, I didn't know other people felt like that. I thought it was just me. And you're, and you're just normalizing those feelings. And I think it just makes everybody feel it lifts everybody up when everybody feels realizes that we're all the same. Yeah. I think it just it takes away those extremes. Um, so that it doesn't get to the point where you feel like you, you can't continue. It stops you before you get to that, that point, having that community and having that support. Um, you know, because we yeah. can all spiral pretty heavily and pretty quickly. So having that kind of, like I said before, that crash mat, because I like that analogy of just like throwing you back into shit um, yeah. with a little bit more like force than you had going down. So, yeah. Alex and I are pros, pros at spiraling. We have <laughs> written yeah. the entire book on spiraling. If you look up spiraling in the dictionary, there's a photo of Alex and I. I don't know, we, man, because yeah. my pal Sarah and I, we work together at the United Way. We call ourselves the Spiral Sisters because, oh, you... we'll, yeah, we'll we'll let us we'll go, we'll do it. We should start a yeah. club. We should. And Imposter Sisters, Spiral Sisters. I love Spiral it. Sisters. <laughs> Are you guys comfortable sharing some of the tips from your presentation on finding your voice? I'm curious. Sure. Go yeah, for we it. kind of like uh, packaged it because I am a marketer at heart and I can't help myself into uh, five five C's. Uh, so I called it, it seize, seize the day. Um, oh, I love it. We need a moment just to appreciate that. Right. <laughs> right? right. I, love okay. it. Um, I, I will say I did, I did laugh at Alex when she came up with this whole idea of seize the day. I'm like, oh, of course you did. Of <laughs> course you did that. It was so funny. Love it. I just, yeah. Uh, so it really boils down. What we did was kind of just looked at the topics that came up for us and our lived experiences, but also the topics that came up from our guests as well. 
and kind of broke it down into five C's. And those were um, community. So we've talked a lot, a lot about having a support network and how important yeah. that is. Cost of not speaking out or the, um, it's said about setting boundaries. So the, um, what was the word? It was actually not the cost, was it? Where Yeah, it, it, for it. the boundary one, it was. Oh, it was calling it out. So calling specifically out. C- calling yeah. out the behaviors that you won't accept by outlying the ones that you will. Um, building a confidence bank. So that's, you know, either it's physically keeping feedback or having a digital file that you can refer to or, you know, something that you can go back to when you really need a little bit of a boost. Uh, one of our guests called it a hooray folder, which is really fun. Um, so that oh, having wow. a, a bank of confidence boosting material that you can fall on and then the courage to find your voice and understand that you have a unique perspective. So sometimes we can get in our own heads about, oh, everyone's already saying that. I have nothing new to add to the conversation without thinking about our unique take on things and who's going to relate specifically to what we have to say and how we have to say it and like really embracing the differences instead of just trying to be the same. Uh, and then the last one is the opportunity cost of not speaking your voice. So, you know, all those times yeah. you sat at a boardroom table and felt like I really want to input, but I'm so scared of what's going to happen or well, what are people going to say? And then like, leaving that meeting and not saying what you wanted to say, or even worse, someone else saying what you wanted to say. Um, and not, you know, just so that that opportunity cost of what's going to happen in your life if you don't actually, you know, take those opportunities. So that's sort of like the very basic version of it. And we have a lot of actionable items in each of those categories that we talk about. But those were sort of the main themes that we notice coming up a lot. I love that. And I love I think we talked about that boardroom scenario and my yeah. our episode together. And I, I can relate so much to that feeling of just like, you know, sometimes, and I'm not attributing it all to this, but sometimes being the only woman in the room or being the youngest person in the room or or whatever that looks like from earlier in my career and just being like, oh, I can't share that. What if it, everybody thinks I'm silly or what if I stumble over my words or what if somebody, whatever. And then when you said somebody else getting to the idea first, that just is, a, that's just a punch in the gut. I know we've all experienced it at some point in our careers for sure. Yeah. Yeah. And, and then what happens a lot of times is if you don't speak up, you know, like using the boardroom scenario, for example, if you don't speak up and you don't use your voice, suddenly you then end up getting resentful. You get left behind. Oh, yeah. You don't get the bonus. You feel resentful. You're, you get stuck in your career. Um, so all of those, well, there's so many lessons to learn about using your voice and about, you know, being who you are. Um, and so, so we, we, you know, the five C's, have, there's an awful lot we learned from all of you, from yourself, from Michelle, from Ashley, from absolutely everybody who's been on our podcast that we were yeah. able to put into a structure for a presentation. And it's we're pretty proud of the, that that piece of work, I think. It's awesome. And I love your confidence bank. Like I one of I had a life coach a few years ago who gave me the I thought incredibly awkward task of asking people to tell me like three words that they would use to describe me. And I did it because she made me, <laughs> but I felt like I was like, speaking of ego, like I felt like, oh, they're going to think that my ego is huge. And I just want like people to like hear all good things about myself or whatever. But it was such a cool exercise. And I actually legit still refer back to some of those things when I'm feeling like a bag of poo. I'm like, I need to remind myself of how other people see me. Exactly. Our confidence bank, the idea is in a digital format, it would be, you know, photos that you've loved through the years, put them in a yeah. folder, um, testimonials, words, quotes, all the things that people have said about you, all of the like good work that you've done, those sorts of things, put it all in one place. And that way, when you're down on yourself, or you're about to go into a job interview and feeling very worried or thinking that you're not good enough, or whatever yeah. it might be, open up that folder and look at all of that stuff. That's how people see you that's your true north that's who you are yeah. and and it should really lift you up to give you that little bit of a um just a little bit of a boost going into an uncomfortable situation that yeah that's who I am like you need it and it's it's yeah. it, all in one place for you to see you know it's it's a visual it's it's great love it so I ask all of my guests if they have inspirational quotes or mantras or things that they might go to similar to our confidence bank, but a little different, like where it's 
something that, again, if you need that bit of a boost, a quote or something that you might turn to, to just kind of lift you up a little bit. Do you guys have something like that? Alex has Colleen, one. It's, Colleen it's, knows what I will say. Cause I, Alex I say has one, one and constantly. it's kind of working for me as well. So go for it, Alex. It's a great one. I actually saw it on a reel at the end of last year and I kind of took it as my 2024 mantra, so to speak, but it's, um, it said peace is letting other people be wrong about you. And uh, I just felt like such a release when I heard that, because I was like, you're right. I can't control what people think about me. And that because they think something about me that is upsetting, it doesn't mean it's right. And they can be wrong about me. And that has no impact on me. So it's another take on that sort of what people think about you is none of your business. Yeah. But I just really loved because peace is something that I, something I'm really striving for um, right now in this season of my life. And being able to like kind of remember that when something is really nagging at me and being like, that's not about you, you know, let that go, let them be wrong. It doesn't matter. So that has been a huge one for me. And I like have fallen back on that one several times. And I will quote it anytime anyone asks me, because I just think it's like one of those stop you in your tracks kind of moments. I love it. Isn't that a great, isn't that a great one? And then for me, I went through a very dark period in my life about two years ago, and I'm still kind of making my way out of it. I'm almost out of it, but it takes a little bit of time. But when I was going through the darkest period, I saw this quote that said, you're yet to meet all of the people who are going to love you. And it was such a shock to me that, oh, yeah, wait, there's a whole life down the road of people that I'm yet to meet. There's a lot of good people that are going to enter my life. And it just kind of opened my eyes that um, life is good. Oh, I love it. That's I just love asking that question because there's always something different. Everybody, everybody I ask always comes with something different. Some people come, they say, eh, it's not really my thing. But for the most part, there's that thing that you just easily go back to that you're just like, okay, I need that pick me up. And when in a comparison world, <laughs> I love both of those quotes, because I think they relate to, you know, past people how people might think of you in the past but also that there's more people that you can you can meet and fall in love with in the future yeah this is coming from a woman who is about to be a grandmother so you know two years ago when I was in kind of a dark place and here I am with a daughter who's pregnant and I've got a grandbaby on the way and it's like wow you know it's just it's pretty cool it's pretty cool to me that is very cool are you guys doing a season three we are We've been yeah, signed yeah. in. We've been signed on for season three by ourselves. By our, yeah, by ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> I love it. Um, yeah. we are we are thinking about changing the day that we record and possibly the location, just because we find the Sunday evenings to be a little bit um, difficult for us, but also for guests too. Yeah. So we may not be still at the Melamog location. We're looking at different alternatives, but we're definitely coming back for season three. We have a few guests already lined up. Um, yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah. I, the imposter in me was just thinking, oh man, like I'm flying by the seat of my pants on season four. You guys have it so much more together than I do, but I'm going to let myself not feel that way. We all are doing our own thing. <laughs> yeah. Don't we, overthink we that. Don't. You, have, you have to go. When did, when did, um, how long, how long does your season go? What do you do? For your it's, season? Listen, Colleen, it, I have, I just fly by the seat of my pants. <laughs> Same. <laughs> We, yeah, us too. Yeah, we, 20 episodes is what. So I, it was when I first applied for Mental Health Foundation funding this time last year that I was like, okay, I really need to start thinking about what it's actually going to look like. Because before I had like 15 episodes one season and like 25 episodes. Yeah, so it's 20, 20 episodes now. Yeah, yeah that's what just... our season ended up being this time. We started late because we only launched our podcast in March of last year. So, and then we, we really like to take the summer off. So we only recorded from March until June last year, but this time we started in September. So I think we had 11 episodes in our first season and then 20 and 20 is probably where we'll cap it. I would guess. Yeah. Yeah. Just, you know, throwing spaghetti at the wall. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. I love it. Awesome. Yeah. Listen, thank you guys both so much. I'm so glad we had a chance to to do swapsies and chat on each other's podcasts. It was so great chatting with both of you again. Yeah. Thank awesome. you for letting thank us. You so much. 
Yeah, thank you for having us on to chat about our podcast where we love listening to you. We could talk to you all day long and we appreciate Agreed. it. Ooh. Thanks again to Colleen and Alex for overthinking with me about imposter syndrome and all of the things that go along with it. And thanks once again to the Mental Health Foundation of Nova Scotia for supporting this podcast.